Hey guys, I'm Chris Buck, and I'm very warm. Welcome to Friday Fretworks, and this week, five pieces of gear that I would never sell. Okay, so before we delve into this video, there's going to be a few obvious caveats to this list. My first guitar, my custom Rev Star, my Highway 1 Strat, sentimental items that not only would I never sell, but would probably be the first items that I would grab in that dreaded hypothetical scenario of a house fire. No, this list is going to be more focused on the things that, if anything was to happen to them, unfortunately, I would do my damnedest to try and replace as quickly as possible. And thus it is with some sense of irony that the very first thing on the list is the one that, even if I really wanted to, I don't think I would even know where to start to try to find another. And that is my Fender Super Reverb. A Super Reverb's, of course, not inherently rare. Look on Reverb now, you'll find probably hundreds of them. There'll be countless on there. But as long as I live, I don't think I'll find another quite as unique or as storied as my Super Reverb. Now, my research would suggest that it started life in a key phrase here, as a 1967 black panel or blackface super reverb before someone decided to take matters into their own hands. Now, my journey with this amp started in finding a ToneQuest report article dated from a few years back, ToneQuest report being an online magazine dedicated to all things esoteric and slightly weird in the guitar world, where the magazine uncovered the amp from a storage facility in Atlanta, Georgia, where they commented, bizarrely, on its originality, save for pretty much anything aesthetic in regard to this amp. Someone, at some point in their infinite wisdom, had decided to retolex the amp and give it a custom-made faceplate, essentially turn it into a somewhat fictional brownface Super Reverb. Now, of course, Fender's brownface era technically ended kind of late 63, pretty much coinciding with the introduction of the Super Reverb. So I guess there is a very slim chance that this was maybe a, a custom order or one-off, but the date code on the transformer kind of go against that. So, at which point, I guess the only real natural conclusion that this amp is an original 67 Super Reverb that someone wanted to make unique. Now, the next reference I can find for this amp is it being for sale at Thunder Road Guitars in Seattle after ToneQuest Report had sold it on Reverb. Pretty much the same condition, apart from four new speakers, four new non-original speakers, and frustratingly, now non-original output transformer. I guess there's going to be a degree of speculation involved here as to what happened to both the original speakers and output transformer, but I guess the only real obvious conclusion being that someone maybe blew a speaker and as a consequence then blew the output transformer. At this point it then had a Mercury clone replacement transformer and four warehouse veteran speakers. The next it appears, it's actually in North Wales, believe it or not, someone had it imported it into the UK, then found its way down to Cardiff, and ultimately found its way to me. The first thing I did to this amp was to replace the warehouse veterans with Celestian G10s for a bit more efficiency and kind of perceived headroom, and it's been on pretty much every gig that I've done since. It is a truly outstanding amp, probably my favourite that I've ever owned, and somewhat frustratingly, as I said, pretty much irreplaceable.
Next up, we have a guitar that, in all honesty, I don't play anywhere near enough. But every time I do, I'm reminded what a truly astonishingly good guitar it is. It's my 2012 Gibson SG61 reissue. Now, again, you're probably not going to associate me with this guitar. I have taken it on a few tours and gigged it live, but if you have seen it, it's more than likely going to be on YouTube or on social media. I bought it kind of 2021, I guess, mid-2021, during lockdown, sight and seen online. Crucially, I didn't know the guy I was buying it off and trusted his opinion on how good a guitar it was, and suffice to say, it's very much a gamble that paid off. It is a truly outstanding instrument. It's loaded with Sunbear PAF pickups, as well as a Faber tailpiece and bridge, all of which were on or in the guitar when I bought it. And it's super lightweight, super resonant, very, very loud acoustically. And it's one of those rare guitars that is near enough a perfect balance of being effortless to play, but still pushing back a little bit, making you feel like you're alive when you play it. It's that kind of guitar that I really tend to gravitate towards. Of course, there is no guarantee that if you went and simply bought another 61 SG reissue, that it would be as good as this one. Guitars are very much variable in that respect. But it was encouraging to see that I recently played, I think it was a 2006 61 SG reissue at Vintage Roy Guitars in Bath here in the UK. And that as well was an astoundingly good guitar. So maybe, just maybe Gibson hit a bit of a purple patch around this era. Either way, it's very much one of my New Year's resolutions just to play this guitar much more than I currently do. Sounds a little bit like this. Next up, we have something much, much more affordable and hopefully infinitely easier to replace should I ever need to do so. That, of course, being the exotic EP Booster. Now, honestly, I can't really remember where or when I got this pedal. I just remember that. It seems to have been on every iteration of my pedal board that I can ever remember putting together. And crucially, when it hasn't been there, things definitely don't sound as good. For those uninitiated, the exotic EP Booster is essentially a recreation of that fabled preamp from the EP3 Echoplex, of course used by the likes of Jimmy Page or Van Halen, Eric Johnson, etc, etc. So many incredible guitar players over the years putting the Echoplex to use not as a delay unit, its primary function ultimately, but for the magic of its preamp. And to date, the EP Booster is probably the most widely recognised recreation or accurate recreation of that preamp, and crucially, in a tiny form factor. Now for a new EP booster, you're going to be looking somewhere in the region of about £130, but a quick look through eBay sold listings, you're probably going to pick one up for around about £70, or $85 give or take. And for a pedal that just consistently, as an always on pedal that adds colour and body and character and sparkle to your tone, all of those slightly vague words that us guitar players tend to gravitate towards, they really are unparalleled. Not on my last pedal board, I was actually using it as a solo boost, just being kicked in and out as and when I needed to make myself louder. But that was pretty much just due to the size constraints of that board. And I always felt that I really was missing something by not having it always in the chain. So when I got a slightly bigger board, needless to say, it went straight back to the end of my signal chain. And I think it will sit there forever more. It's honestly one of the few pedals that, irrespective of someone's style or their kind of musical preferences or their rig or their guitar, that I would have absolutely zero hesitation in recommending. It is a truly magic pedal. Next up, we have another amplifier, this time one that not many people are likely to associate with me, I would say, but in reality one which will always hold a special place in my heart. That, of course, being my Marshall JCM800 2x12 100 watt combo. And I've actually done a dedicated video on this amp, which I shall link to above, but suffice to say that this is about as close as I've ever actually kind of experienced to that Wayne's World white strap moment. It will be mine. Oh yes, it will be mine. 
Now, growing up as a devout Slash disciple, all that I wanted as a kid was a Marshall Silver Jubilee and two 4x12 cabinets, of course. But in the South Wales Valleys as a 16-year-old, before Marshall reissued them as well, it's worth adding, wanting one of those was about as realistic, both in terms of affordability and availability, as maybe a Ferrari 250 GT California. It wasn't going to happen, and thus... The next best or the most realistic kind of aspirational item that I could set my heart on was a JCM 800. Not to say that the JCM 800s were ubiquitous throughout the 1980s, would really be putting it mildly. You'll probably struggle to find a music video without one or maybe five stacked up behind the guitarist. But as taste changed and stacks gave way in place of Blues Juniors, prices started to drop to the point where, as a 17-year-old playing in a consistent pub band around the South Wales Valleys every Friday, Saturday night, I could just about afford one. So, I bought one, and I honestly don't think I've ever been happier. I might not use it much today, honestly, it could probably do with a good service, but it is still my reference point for great 70s, 80s rock tone. And although there are maybe amps or modelers or profilers that can get somewhat close, standing in front of that amp at full bore is a truly somewhat biblical, visceral experience. It is majestic. And as much as there are reissues that Marshall have done in recent years, those original units don't really fetch all that money. So if you are chasing that sound, factor in the price of maybe a good service by an amp tech, just grab an original. They are truly worth the investment. <laughs> Last, but by no means least, definitely the cheapest bit of gear on my pedal board, if not actually the cheapest bit of gear that I own. Coming in at a princely sum of around £20, $25 second hand, there's of course the Moore Trelicopter. Now, honestly, I can't remember when I got this pedal, it just seems to have been on my board since the dawn of time, and of course it's famously based on the Demeter Tremulator, but having never tried an original, I can't really speak for its accuracy. All that I know is that despite the HX Storm, the Line 6 HX Storm, having pretty much replaced every standalone modulation pedal on my pedal board, the Trilocopter is still there. Now, admittedly, a large part of that is down to the functionality of that big speed knob on the front, being able to control the tremolo speed in real time, but that in itself really isn't to be sniffed at. And coupled that with its incredible depth control then, which will take you anywhere from kind of subtle Fender Amp-esque tremolo, through that Boulevard of Broken Dreams S helicopter taking off sound, it really is an invaluable pedal on my pedal board. Again, there's going to be countless sound examples of this pedal on YouTube, and let's be honest, the tremolo pedal isn't the most exciting one in the world to demonstrate, so I'm going to play you on something else now just for a little bit of fun. But as ever, thank you very much for watching. I'm Chris Buck, this is Friday Fretworks. Please subscribe, hit the bell icon if you haven't already, and I shall see you next week for another episode of Friday Fretworks. Cheers, guys, take care. See you soon. <laughs>